Good morning, everybody. Um, so thank you for joining us. I think we're going to kick off uh, now with the event, uh, Lessons from a Crisis, How to Achieve a Climate Neutral, Energy Secure and Prosperous Transition for Europe and the Business Sector. I'm delighted to chair this timely event, which will bring together business networks from across Europe that work to support climate and sustainability. All across Europe, business networks have been working actively to increase climate ambition, recognizing the economic, social and environmental benefits of the transition towards a climate neutral, resource efficient and sustainable Europe. And day by day, we see momentum growing from businesses across Europe, across sectors, across sizes. And we really see enormous support for uh, the transition. It's been a very uh, heavy year, as we all know, enormous uh, changes in the geopolitics following the invasion of Ukraine, enormous uh, new plans on repower, uh, aiming to reduce Europe's dependency from Russian fossil fuels, changes to big pieces of climate legislation that are aimed to achieve our 2030 target. Um, but broadly, what we see is that um, businesses are supporting the increase in ambition. We worked with uh, more than 150 businesses to, uh, that called on the EU to strengthen energy security by accelerating the green transition. We see that this is a no regrets option. We must, we must do this. Um, another key element, of course, is the, the questions around the Fit for 55 package. Um, we would clearly like from our side to see some uh, ambition on this in the next period. We're looking at the Renewable Energy Directive and the discussions on the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. These will be really key planks to giving long-term policy security and certainty for businesses and to direct the investment that we need. Another key element we see coming up this year is uh, the EU's response to the Inflation Reduction Act. And we would be really keen to look into what the opportunities are and, and how this new Net Zero Industry Act will, will change the, the landscape of the EU. Clearly, we see that companies have been developing solutions. And what we would like to see are policies that support this and can enable them to develop and scale these up and increase their competitiveness in the EU and globally. So this event will be an opportunity to reflect on, on the progress made during last year and the response from policy makers and solutions to deal with the current energy crisis, but also to see how we can um, look forward and help increase the competitive sustainability of industry and green investments. So we'll be looking at solutions and hearing from a number of different policy makers to see what they think are the key challenges this year. We'll be hearing from businesses and business networks on the important role of policies, and we'll look at how we can stimulate green investments. Um, I, um, just to introduce myself in particular, work with Corporate Leaders Group Europe, which is a, a group of businesses that are uh, really following these, these issues. And I think we're really looking forward to seeing how we can support ambition this year, how we can look to solutions to the different crises that are effect is affecting the EU, and see how we can drive forward some solutions. Um, so during this event, uh, we'll start with the scene setter. So looking at lessons learned from 2022 and from looking forward to 2023. So we have speakers from the commission and the parliament. Then we'll move forward to hear what the Spanish presidency are planning on climate and energy related priorities. And, um, and then we'll look into some of the key issues. So firstly, renewable energy and energy efficiency. And then secondly, looking at the competitive sustainability of the EU's econo economy and industry. So I think it will be a really fascinating and, and deep discussion today. And we look forward to, to hearing from all the speakers. One final point. So of course you can, you can put your questions submit questions via uh, this GoTo webinar, and we will try and take them as possible during the discussion. We'll be monitoring that. And um, of course, we'll be tweeting on, um, and so forth. So please join in online and don't hesitate to share your thoughts. Um, I think with this, I'd be delighted to bring in um, the speakers for the first session. So Yvonne, um, if you could turn your camera on. And um, um, MEP Kamfa, if, if you're there, if you could also turn your camera on. But perhaps for now, if we could start with Yvonne Slingenberg. Yvonne, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Yvonne is the Director of Strategy, Analysis and Planning in, in DG Klima. 
She's had a, a long, illustrious career in the Commission across DG Environment, several Commissioner Cabinets, and more recently on International Affairs. But since the end of 2020, she's been responsible more for climate strategy, governance and emissions. So I think we really look forward to hearing your views on, on how you see the next year. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Please yeah, go ahead. Thanks, Ursula, and good morning, everyone. Very nice to be with you. Um, already last year, I think you had my colleague Clara de la Torre in, in, in the event, more or less around the same time. So uh, happy to continue the conversation. Um, of course, last year it was all about, you know, um, the COVID pandemic, uh, how we kind of, you know, uh, kept the Green Deal uh, as part of that uh, um, fighting the pandemic, the, the recovery and resilience facility. Uh, asking member states plans to also focus on, well, actually to, to prioritize the investments in uh, accelerating the transition to so renewables, energy efficiency, uh, innovation in industry, infrastructure, etc. Um, and I think we are, uh, just to, to, to put on that uh, issue, we are progressing well. I mean, member states are uh, uh, currently imp implementing their plans, they're asking for their payment requests, etc. So, that track has uh, progressed well, I think, more or less. Um, of course, still to be seen on the ground, so to say, uh, what really happens. But then, unfortunately, uh, after the event you had last year, uh, we have seen a major unexpected, uh, or at least in terms of dimension, uh, event happening with the, uh, the aggression of Russia on Ukraine, um, which has triggered, of course, as we all know, uh, really very serious consequences in terms of very high, high energy prices due to the fact that people were kind of scrambling to secure energy supply. Of course, we're profiting of that. I'm in my warm house. I'm not uh, like the people in Ukraine, you know, uh, uh, in too much of a cold. Um, and also uh, at the same time, it kind of uh, pushed the point much more to the fore that we need to become more independent of fossil fuels, not only Russian fossil fuels, but fossil fuels in general. So it has kind of, you know, given an, an, an additional boost to the need to accelerate when it comes to uh, renewable energy generation and, and uh, energy efficiency. So um, the, at EU level, we there again have come with a plan, which was the Repower EU plan, as you mentioned, Ursula, uh, where again, member states can top up their recovery plans with Repower specific plans. Of course, this is also sometimes looking at, you know, uh, additional, uh, uh, if we want to call it like that, fossil fuel infrastructure, but this is always uh, intended to be very temporary and enabling uh, the transition towards either renewables or green hydrogen, et cetera. Um, so we have been able, I think, uh, you know, to take uh, or to stay the course on the Green Deal in these very turbulent times. And yeah, we are, of course, also particularly pleased that uh, the, um, the process we were in the middle of, which was the Fit for 55 package with all the different legal proposals, we have been able to deliver on that. Uh, we have found agreements, at least on the five uh, climate files that are part of the Fit for 55 package by the end of last year, political agreements that is, still needing formal uh, approval and publication, of course, in the official journal. Uh, and, and Pascal Confin uh, will certainly be able to testify, you know, to the complexity of those files, their interlinkages, how they all, uh, you know, support each other and, and are, you know, to a certain extent dependent on each other. And, you know, the long hours that has gone into that, but I wanted to emphasize also the really common resolve to, to make that happen despite all the uncertainties and the complexities. So I think that was excellent news. Um, of course, other uh, parts of the Fit for 55 package still to be finalized. You mentioned yourself, the Renewable Energy Directive, the Energy Efficiency Directive, we have the Energy Performance in Buildings Directive, we have the transport for uh, the, the fuels in aviation and maritime, files, we have things like the Energy Taxation Directive. Now, I just want to emphasize that, of course, uh, the Taxation Directive requires unanimity, but that doesn't mean that member states cannot already act. You know, they can also try and do like is being done in the US, uh, you know, tax breaks for certain things, etc. So um, let's hope that also uh, member states are looking into that. Now, um, what does that mean? Just to recap, we, uh, we have strengthened the uh, EU's emission trading system uh, to bring the level of ambition up to making sure that we meet the minus 55%. We have brought in uh, the whole maritime sector, which is, uh, you know, we have been building up towards that, first putting in place monitoring and reporting, but uh, by now they will start coming in. And that is, I think, a really big additional coverage uh, of this carbon pricing instrument in, in terms of sectors. And then I think a very uh, important achievement also where Mr. Confin himself has been particularly active is this new 
emissions trading system for buildings and uh, and road transport. So the, putting a carbon price on the fuels that are being used in these sectors, and this really will enable uh, or help member states also to achieve their their effort sharing targets, so their national targets for these sectors also to achieve them in a, in a more cost efficient manner. That has of course always been the purpose. Now um, I think it was very clear in everybody's mind that adding a, a cost, if you want, you know, or a price uh, onto uh, the fuel that is being used in in households and and uh, yeah, also for for mobility is of course um, not an easy thing to explain. To citizens, so uh, a lot of work has gone into building, you know, safeguards around, uh, you know, countering uh, excessive price fluctuations, uh, to make sure that we have funding tools to actually, you know, uh, support this uh, this transition and and as we call it, leave no one behind. Uh, and for that, we have been setting up a, a social climate fund. I'm sure you all know about it. Uh, to really, um, you know, address the vulnerable citizens and the vulnerable micro enterprises, and to help them with uh, 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 money, basically, again, on the basis of plans that the member states will need to make their social climate plans in a couple of years, to make sure that, you know, they can also make this change, that we can enable the necessary investments in insulation, in in renewable uh, uh, generation, also the shift in mobility. So a big, big uh, fund, a new additional fund at EU level, uh, additionally. Uh, for that. Now, I already mentioned the national targets, so the effort sharing regulation increased ambition has been agreed. We have, I think, a very visible uh, agreement also on cars, where we have agreed that, you know, there will be only zero emission cars uh, put on the market uh, in 2035. We, of course, also have strengthened the trajectory towards that, so an increased uh, target for 2030. Um, and let me also mention the land sector, because sometimes this is a little bit, you know, forgotten, but in order to get to climate neutrality by 2050, excuse me, as we, uh, as we all know, that is a binding legal requirement that we're working towards set in the European climate law of 2021, we will need a major contribution of the land sector. Um, and we really uh, need to, you know, make sure that we don't have increasing emissions there, but in particular also that we increase the carbon absorption of the land. Um, and that will need to happen by 2030 and even beyond, you know, we will really need to step up on that one. Now, with those different um, pieces of legislation, we have, let's say, ensured that we would be meeting the minus 55% goal. Of course, all those other files that we mentioned before will be contributing and will be helping to achieve them. Um, so they're kind of like, you know, different elements. If you remember that slide we had in the beginning, the B, uh, hive, you know, with all the different uh, contributions. So that is still to happen. But um, yeah, nevertheless, we have the necessary architecture in place that should uh, make us get there in 2030. It is only seven years, I want to emphasize by now. So not that much time to, to really uh, make it happen. We have a few other pieces of legislation I also wanted to mention because they're of some relevance to the people uh, in, in the panels and in the audience. We have uh, legislation of fluorinated uh, greenhouse gases and ozone depleting substances where we want uh, the, the leakage and you know uh, the emissions from these um, devices that have these gases in them so heat pumps in particular switch gear as well to really move away from you know these these uh, greenhouse gases that are uh, part of them and use new techniques so that is also a very important piece of legislation. We're going to be, or we have put forward a voluntary framework for carbon uh, removals, where again, that should help uh, increase these carbon uh, absorptions in particular post 2030, as we see it, uh, but to really learn our lessons there and to try and get that in place. Uh, and then of course, very shortly, we will also be coming with um, standards for heavy duty vehicles. So to also you know, tackle that part of the transport sector. Um, I want to mention that we will shortly also be launching, well, in the coming, I would say, two months, uh, uh, our, our work and notably our open public consultation on uh, the next big um, milestone, which is to set a target for 2040. Now, we uh, are very conscious of the fact that this will may or may sound a bit crazy for people, you know, to... <laughs> have only just done uh, uh, the, the architecture for 2030 and here we start again talking about 2040 but at the same time this is a requirement that we have in the European climate law uh, as you all know it takes quite some preparation to get to such a new uh, assessment you know impact assessment etc cetera, etc cetera. 
So we are starting that work and we hope uh, for your uh, understanding that you know we will start that despite the fact that of course we have a huge task ahead of us in terms of implementation. And this is implementing legislation, but it is also really uh, you know now looking at how member states and all the different uh, players, so local and regional authorities, but also of course very much the business sector are going to help to realize all the ambition we have in these different pieces of, le uh, pieces of legislation. So action on the ground, and I think that will of course then be determinant for the acceptability of going to the next step, any 2040 uh, targets. Um, we will have national energy and climate plans that need to be updated, but I very much want to emphasize that this will need to go uh, hand in hand and, and fully aligned with the uh, recovery and resilience plans and of course the repower plans. So within the Commission, we're working very closely together to make sure that you know uh, the, the funds that are available, and I think there is not a lack of funds, despite a bit of a panic on the IRA, but there is an enormous amount of funds. We also have all the ETS revenues that member states now have to use uh, towards climate purposes. So in terms of investments, there is money, but there needs to be coherence in how uh, you know the member states set out what are their priorities, what are they going to do to really you know, roll out this increase in renewable energy generation and energy efficiency in particular. And that can then, of course, also really help for, for next winter and make sure that we don't end up in a similar uh, situation as, as the, the situation we had early autumn with so high uh, energy prices. Um, and that I would just like to emphasize that, you know, is really all about, um, in my view, business working together with member states, you know, where uh, are things still not working? Where do we need to tackle uh, national bottlenecks? How can we really, uh, you know, plan these seven years? Because of course we know that we have bottlenecks also again in terms of, you know, sometimes supply chain issues, um, uh, well, the critical raw materials, but even the other raw materials, we have workforce issues. But I think that is really a, a situation and a challenge for member states that they need to tackle also in terms of, you know, attracting the necessary workforce uh, and planning ahead in terms of, uh, you know, again, um, in the permitting renewable energy proposal, there are options to, to look at go-to areas, et cetera, et cetera. But I think we will need to start seeing in the coming year, one, two, three years, that things are really changing on the ground for member states to keep confidence and to keep uh, supporting uh, the transition uh, and to really be able to make the change. So, of course, that is, and I will finish with that, going to be uh, essential not only within Europe, um, but also to continue on the international stage to be able to say, look, we have not gone, of course, we, ha we are still uh, implementing the Green Deal, we are at it, we have all our regulation in place, and now we're going to make it happen on the ground. Uh, COP28, I think, is already on many people's minds at the end of this uh, year, and, and that will be a very important moment in time to, again, have that conversation. And, of course, we don't just do it at the COP, we do it throughout the year, but to say, okay, we are in in the light of all these challenges, we are still, you know, uh, not only implementing our transition, but also accelerating it. So, um, very happy to, to be in the panel and the whole day and to listen to uh, all the things that are happening in the business Hello. sector. It, it will be crucial, you know, to, to have these innovative solutions rolled out, taken up and, and, and keep the momentum. So, yeah, happy to, uh, to be with you for the rest of the morning. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yvonne, much appreciated. Um, so I think I heard uh, MEP Confan just now. Uh, can you hear us? Yes, Hello? I can. Sorry for, for the delay. Yeah. Well, thank you so uh, much for joining us. Uh, so uh, we just heard a bit from Yvonne about her view of the year looking ahead and, and of the past. So thank you so much, Yvonne. Um, perhaps it'd be great to hear from you, um, you know, as the chair of the Environment Committee and had to deal with so much in the past year and looking ahead. Um, uh, on, on your view of, of, of the role that businesses have had in this political discussion and, and where they've had impact and what more we should be doing moving forward. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, go ahead, sir. Okay, so uh, first, uh, thank you for uh, the invitation. Uh, sorry for the delay, but I have technical difficulties to, to join. Uh, so I have a limited amount of time. <laughs> I will focus on a, a few key messages. Uh, first, um, I think we, you played, uh, uh, and the, the progressive business community played a, a, a massive role, a massive role uh, in uh, delivering what we have already delivered 
uh, let's say uh, the fit for 55 uh, in, in a nutshell. Uh, and more than ever, the alliance between uh, uh, the political families and the, the political decision makers uh, from various groups uh, uh, and uh, the progressive businesses are key. I mean, this alliance is key more than ever. So we need to uh, make that uh, work. And it is, I would say, the only way to keep on delivering. Why? Because we have, uh, in the context of uh, uh, the war uh, uh, in Ukraine and uh, inflation and uh, uh, everything we, we, we uh, are, uh, have uh, challenges, uh, we have two trends one which is positive for the green deal another one which is negative for the green deal so the negative one is obviously uh inflation uh energy prices uh, less competitiveness in europe and uh, uh threat or the narrative on the threat regarding food security if you put all that together you have a counter narrative to the green deal and uh, that it could be a risk for the Green Deal. And this narrative is politically more and more endorsed by, in the Parliament, EPP, plus ECR, plus, of course, far right. And what we can see in some countries, and uh, it's obvious, uh, recently in Italy, in Sweden, uh, is an alliance of this counter narrative and of course they can win it's uh, the the beauty of democracy so the only way to counter that is to build on the positive trend the positive trend is this crisis is a crisis of our dependency to fossil fuel so let's speed up on energy efficiency let's speed up on renewables and for those who want to do it for nuclear, let's speed up on decarbonization of industry because the year 2022 will remain, and that's my deep conviction, will remain as the year where the competition, the real competition for the location of green value chains and green industries and green technologies really started. Of course, with China and with the US, with IRA. Uh, so, now, the, the battle for the location, for the shoring of, of where the green hydrogen will be built, where the cheap uh, windmills will be located, where the uh, green steel will be produced, and so on, it's now, it's now on. For, same for batteries, for electrolyzers, for EVs, and so on, and so on. And it's a typical <laughs> battle where we need progressive industries with us because it's a battle for regulation, for standards, for investment, for their risking, and so on, and so on. And that's the only way to speed up Green Deal for real now. And of course, once, and of course, this, this is the core of what uh, we are trying to design in response to IRA. And what is very interesting in the narrative is that before the IRA, I would say be spring 2022 and up to the IRA, we managed to uh, deliver on the Fit for 55, but the macro the macro narrative which was growing was the uh, first narrative I was refer referring to. Let's say the anti-Green Deal, or if not anti-Green Deal, let's be cautious, don't go too fast, don't go too far. You know, that's the typical uh, rational we, we can hear. Since the IRA came in the European debate, and uh, strongly, <laughs> uh, it reshaped again okay oh guys no it's really not the time to uh, slow down it's on the contrary the time to speed up to simplify to be more predictable in in the support we give and so on and, so on. and we, that's why we are uh, uh, again in a new sequence where uh, we are designing additional responses uh, which is of course good in order to speed up uh, uh, the delivering on the green deal so that's where we are i'm not going into to enter into all the five uh, of course unless uh, first we have time second you have questions uh, uh but that's the, the the key messages i wanted to share and uh, the the key the, the key key one the top priority is 
let's keep on working together because what we delivered, for instance, on deforestation, on imported deforestation, we delivered it only, only because we managed to find it. And a, 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 not an agreement, but a pass to a model which had been tested by some progressive businesses in the agro food uh, sector. And they came to us and they say, well, it works. It's just it does not work at scale because not all the actors are uh, uh, have to comply with this rule, but it delivers. We know how to do it. And it was impossible for the most conservative ones to say it's not working, uh, uh, there is no sourcing, uh, you cannot trace it, and so on, because actually in the real world it was not. Same for cars. Imagine the debate on cars without a few uh, car makers saying, we are supporting of that, we will do it, we will invest in it. Forget about the political decision as we did. So that's why this uh, uh, key element uh, of uh, association between uh, progressive businesses and progressive uh, decision makers, political decision makers, is key and will remain key in the near future. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, MEP Confan. I'm so sorry for your difficulties in joining today. I think, yeah, given given this, I think we'll we'll let you we'll let you go. And I, I really appreciate it. I really take that message that we need to keep supporting we need to keep working with the decision makers to to help uh, deliver some of these really key things in the next year so thank you so much and thank you Yvonne as well I think thank in you. this case we'll move to the next session um so if uh, if Thomas if you could uh, um put on your 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 camera thank you so much for joining thank you sorry apologies we're now a few minutes over the time but um so Thank you so much for joining us, to, um, Mr. Lindman. So he's the director, deputy director general for international affairs in the Ministry of Environment in Sweden, he, and he's had a, a long experience uh, in the Swedish government on climate enterprise and now environment. So we're looking forward to hearing your views on uh, what the Swedish presidency, which of course I'm sure is, is keeping you very busy at the moment. So we look forward to hearing what, how you see the year and your key priorities. So thank you, Mr. Lindman. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Ursula, and um, it was very interesting to listen to, to Yvonne and Pascal before. And uh, of course, it will be some sort of uh, repetition here, uh, even if I will try to have the presidency, presidency perspective on this. Uh, but as you all knew, know that Sweden is assuming the presidency of the Council at the time of historic challenges, I would say, for the member states as well as for the Union as a whole. Um, Russia's illegal and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine is a threat to the European security and uh, Ukraine is fighting for its survival as a nation and for the security and lives of its citizens. But it also has dire consequences for migration as well as for global food and energy supplies. Um, and the war has also highlighted the need to reduce emissions, uh, complete the transition to a more resource efficient and circular society and make the EU independent of fossil energy. The climate crisis and the biodiversity loss are existential problems that must be resolved together. Here, here we believe that EU has an important role to play as a global leader of the green transition. We must lead by example by delivering on ambitious climate goals and boost growth and competitiveness. During our presidency, we will put the Fit for 55 into action and speed up the energy transition. The Fit for 55 package is, of course, a fundamental tool to reach our climate targets. And of course, we are very thankful to previous presidencies and, of course, also to the Parliament uh, for their tremendous work in finalizing many of these fights. Apart from Fit, Fit for 55, we also hope it will be possible to reach Council mandates on the proposals on fluorinated greenhouse gases, or just F gases, and on some depleting substances. F-gases and most ozone-depleting substances have a global warming potential many times greater than carbon dioxide. So reducing their emissions is necessary to fight climate change. We will also focus on the other climate-related files, such as the CO2 emissions from heavy-duty vehicles that we expect will be tabled at the beginning of, of, of this year. Another proposal we would like to progress on is the carbon removal certification framework. There is a great need for a robust 
legislative framework to help further incentivize the upscaling of these techniques. This will be important for the EU, EU to achieve our 2050 climate targets. In the energy field, we will make legislation related to the energy crisis a priority, including any upcoming proposals for revising the electricity market design. We will make a real effort to finalize as much as possible of the outstanding energy files under Fit for 55 package. All these files will have a long-term impact on energy imports, climate and security of supply. We will continue negotiations on the renewable energy, RED, and energy efficiency directives. And when the European Parliament has adopted this position, we will also take forward the work regarding the directive on energy performance of buildings. This also applies for the regulation on reduced methane emissions in the energy sector. And we will also continue negotiations in the Council on the gas and hydrogen market package. We believe that to some extent we have witnessed a great shift, or at least a shift in the climate debate, whereas businesses in the past was often an obstacle to more ambitious climate policies. Business is now increasingly becoming a driver in the green decision. In some sectors, policy is even lagging behind the industry's commitment. In Sweden, we see a large, we see large-scale private investments across the country in technologies, technologies crucial to the climate transition, such as zero emission steel in new battery factories and carbon capture and storage facilities. So how can businesses and legislators interact? We believe that involving businesses in an early stage in the regulatory discussions is extremely important. The regulatory framework must admit the industry to develop and scale up solutions needed for green transition, while at the same time increasing their competitiveness. An interesting example of interaction is LEADIT, which was an initiative taken by Sweden and India in 2019. This group is working for a green transition of heavy emission intensive industry globally. They work actively with tackling roadblocks and bottlenecks for industry transition and serve as a link between governments and industry in the global efforts to fight climate change. But taking the right measures and creating the best policy framework for business to develop is not always easy. Therefore, I would like to mention that we will host an informal ministerial meeting in Stockholm on the 18th and 19th of April. The meeting will focus on strengthening collaboration with the private sector to speed up the green transition. We believe success comes from a close cooperation between policymakers and businesses. Business leaders from different EU member states will be invited to showcase good examples, experiences and challenges on the road, on the road towards net zero greenhouse gas emissions, circular business models and nature positive operations. We encourage member states to suggest front runner company that is well on the way in the green transition we invite them to the meeting we will take stock of the notion that there is true business case for green transition and champion the idea that the green deal with eu fit for 55 strategy for biological diversity the action plan for circular economy sustainable chemical strategy and related legislation will all contribute to strengthening europe's long-term global competitiveness we hope to inspire by good examples and address roadblocks identified by business frontrunners. The discussion at the informal ministerial meeting will focus on policies that can facilitate and speed up the green transition while improving Europe's competitiveness. So let me finish by repeating the main Swedish messages used for climate action globally, urgency and opportunity. Urgency as proven by science and opportunity proven by the new jobs and growth that the transition brings. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, it was great to hear the, the priorities. Um, I, I believe we've been joined by MEP Gonzalez Caceres, and I, and I understand you have a hard stop, right? You have to leave at 10.45, is that correct? So I may, if, with the, if, if you may allow me, I may make a small quick change to the agenda. I will come back to Nina's response to the Swedish priorities and hear briefly from, from Mr. Um, Gonzalez Caceres, uh, he's a uh, sits on the industry committee and, and is the rapporteur um, and opinion leader on renewable energy um, for the socialist and democrats parties. Um, 
and also looking at questions around permitting, sustainable air transport. So it'd be great. Um, I'm slightly messed, I'm moving the agenda around a little bit, but it'd be great to hear from you briefly, MEP uh, Gonzalez Cateres, about uh, your views on um, uh, on the state of play, in fact, of the negotiations on the Renewable Energy Directive and some of these different elements that, that we need moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ursula, uh, and thank you to CLG Europe for inviting me to this event today, and thank you to all the participants. I, I want to apologize because I cannot stand until the, the end the entire session. Right now, we are living in a some crucial moments when it comes to the energy system in Europe. You know, the war is a disaster for the people, but also a big problem for Europe. Uh, we have to decarbonize our energy sector, and how to do it based on renewables is a big challenge right now. So we are also in the middle of the debate of the Inflation Reduction Act, the American Inflation Reduction Act, and the response announced by the European Commission last week, the Green Deal Industrial Plan and the Net Zero Industry Act. So we are in a very complicated moment and we had to take a lot of decisions. And I think that the current crisis has shown now the weakness of some points of the energy system in Europe and also uh, the industrial supply chain that we have. So we, we can see now a small opportunity window to improve the decarbonization of the energy system and also to be more competitive and to have more competitiveness, to improve our competitiveness also in Europe. And I think that the renewable directive is also an opportunity. We are dealing with the permitting process you mentioned right now. And I think that the, we, we, we did a very important steps in these negotiations. And I think that the permitting process is not going to be a problem to deal in trilogues. Right now, we have other problems in, the, in this negotiation. For example, when it comes to the bioenergy, how to ensure that the bioenergy is a real and clean renewable source of energy. But sometimes we have some doubts. So this is one of the main challenges that we have in the negotiations. And also the, the problem of transport, how to get the transport is really sustainable and not allowing uh, some technologies that are based also in some, in some parts of fossil fuels. So I think this is also a big challenge for us. I want to mention uh, about the, um, the renewable energy directive that uh, we we had to finalize this in before the beginning of the spring. I think the agreement is needed before because, you know, we have to put a lot of investment in order to get more renewables. We have this new farm. We need a lot of people with the skills that we don't have right now because this massive deployment of renewables will need... Uh, different skills that we are not having right now. The workforce is not ready for the big challenge that we are facing. So we need more people engaged. And this is also an opportunity, an opportunity for for our labor system and to decrease the rate of unemployment because we are changing from one economy based on fossil fuels to another that is based on renewables. But we have also to change the skills of the people. I want also to mention the delegated that of the additionality of hydrogen. We are waiting for a long time for this delegated act to be unveiled, but the commission has a bit delay and we need it now. We need a clear additionality framework. We need a strict criteria to avoid greenwashing when it comes to hydrogen. But at the same time, we have to create a hydrogen, a renewable hydrogen market in Europe. So this balance, this balance is needed, but also taking into account that uh, green hydrogen should be based only in renewables. And let me say it 
this last minute that I want to use about the electricity market reform that we are facing for the next months. I think that the, 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 the energy market has shown us in these previous months, in the, la in the last year, that is not well functioning during this kind of crisis. This uh, reliance on fossil fuels uh, uh, stopped us to see the benefits of renewable energy sources because we have more renewables, but we were paying more money in this in this energy market. So I think we need this reform. We have already some proposals, one from my country, Spain. I think that we were as a country in the forefront of the mostly the some of the proposals that were used during this crisis. I think that now we have an opportunity to make a big reform of this market. But but we are waiting for the commission to to make the proposals. Now we are in the in the process and I think that we have to move forward, we have to move fast because we are in the end of the legislature and I don't want to finalize this legislature without this reform. And sorry I apologize because I'm in a meeting and there is a lot of there are a lot of people coming here but for me it was a pleasure and thank you all. Thank you. No, I appreciate very much your insights on where you think we really need to go. And, and I think we will be definitely supporting as much as possible uh, in ambition in, in these areas. So I really much appreciate your, your intervention. Um, so I let you go to your meeting, MEP Gonzalez Caceres, Nicolas, and I uh, move to Nina. Sorry for moving you around, Nina, but delighted you could join us. So Nina founded the Swedish Business Network, uh, the Hager Initiative in 2010, and is executive director and she's somebody who has both business as well as senior government and agency experience. So I think you've got should have some uh, really interesting insights into um, from Sweden and, and broadly and the many things that people have brought up in this panel. So it'd be great to hear from you on your perspective. So please, Nina, go ahead. Thank you so much, Ursula. And it's so much you want to say in these few minutes. So I just want to start saying it was so interesting to hear Thomas talk. Uh, from uh, about uh, priorities for the Swedish presidency. And, and I just love that you mentioned that EU should be a global leader in sustainability. That is super important and that is also really something to live up to. And, and he also mentioned uh, that uh, uh, circularity and he also mentioned uh, heavy vehicles and carbon reduction there and also carbon removal. So that, I think that is also a few important topics uh, and also that uh, Fit for 55 is an important tool. So, and we know that the devil sits in the details. So uh, let's just hope that uh, the Swedish uh, presidency uh, can manage all this. And it's also interesting to hear Yvonne also just want to mention that she mentioned the target, a uh, new target for 2014. I think that is really important been running this business network hug initiative for 12 years and we can see that uh, high ambitions tough targets is super important it's good for business it's good for business advantages and it's good for competition so so we we really welcome uh, new targets and i also just want to mention a few other things connected to because if we see what the private sector in Sweden are doing right now and how we can bring energy into the Swedish presidency. I just want to mention we have two studies in Sweden where we looked at business. We have looked at the 128 large companies at the stock market and we looked 2020 and 2022 and we looked how many of the companies half their emission in their own operation every 10 years. And two years ago, it was 20%. And last year, it was 66% that, that half their emission every 10 years. And we, that's a 300% uh, improvement. <laughs> that's fantastic. And the big companies are also uh, working together with smaller companies. So, so it's a big big influence from companies in Sweden. And in another report, uh, Sweden largest emitters, 
the topic is, uh, and, and the headline for this report is, surprisingly no, uh, Sweden, Sweden's largest emitters turn into negative emitters by 2050. And we can see when we looked at these 20 largest emitters that representing around 30% of Sweden's, Sweden's total emission, uh, we can see that they will not only reduce their own emissions, but they will also become large contributors of negative emissions. So they're going down almost to zero and then contribute to some negative emissions. And that was good because Thomas mentioned just uh, carbon removals. And I think it's so important to see because the, the, the biggest emissions are the hard to abate sector and seeing all that happens there. And also Thomas mentioned uh, uh, hybrid steel without coal and our a battery factory in uh, in the northern Sweden. But I also want to mention three other examples. Company that's really delivering in the carbon transition that we're into right now. We have Lantmannen, Agrethanol, uh, and that is uh, the Nordic region's largest bio refinery. And they will re they refine grain and waste products into ethanol, protein, and carbon dioxide and up to 98% CO2 reduction compared to fossil fuels. And Prim, Sweden's largest oil refining companies, is rethinking their entire value chain to go from being the largest, one of the largest carbon emitters to become climate neutral by 2035 in one, two, and three of the scopes. So that is, that is a fantastic travel they, they're doing. And also we have Stena Recycling and the battery is recycling, and they are building a new factory that will recycle batteries. So it's happening within the business. And we just want to say, we welcome EU's high ambitions. That is so important. And climate policy is a prerequisite for building the business, business models. And that is so important. And I also want to mention just four things that we really need in the future from business, and from, from policy and EU. We need to talk about acceptance, uh, citizens' involvement and acceptance of climate policy. That's important. We need to strengthen the work around circular economy. We, want, we need to look at the question about state aid uh, and the risk of state aid race between countries. That is a risk. And of course, we can see that IRA is both a risk and an opportunity because it will help US handle their climate targets, but we can't have the risk of competing with that. And also last, I just want to mention biodiversity. And I heard someone mentioning it, I think it could be Thomas. Uh, we need to connect biodiversity with climate because it both interacts and support reaching climate and biodiversity. So thank that you. was my response. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. No, thank you so much. That was really fascinating to hear about the different business initiatives in Sweden. And we also really agree on the need to really bring in nature uh, more cons uh, consequently. Now, I know we're running a tiny bit late, so I think I'll move straight to the next section. Um, and I'd be delighted to if Rasmus could join us. Um, so Rasmus Valenko is the Managing Director for Systems Transformation at the We Mean Business uh, Coalition. So he has an enormous wealth of knowledge and experience on looking at transformation in business, looking at collaboration initiatives, and how we can really use this power of collaboration to find innovative solutions. So we've had an, a real depth of discussion recently, but we're looking at the unlocking the tomorrow's renewable energy and efficiency gains today and listening to what everybody has said, Rasmus, I'd be looking forward to hearing your thoughts on this. Thank you, Ursula, and hello to everybody. So I'm Rasmus Volonko with uh, the We Mean Business Coalition. The We Mean Business Coalition is essentially a group of organizations that work with business to drive climate leadership. We represent about 38 trillion in market cap through the companies that we work with across different initiatives around the world. And at the moment, by our count, we have just over 10,000 companies really leading this transition from the corporate sector. I want to give just a couple of numbers in terms of, you know, um, of, of the initiatives that we're working with. And the reason for this is that 
you know, we've moved from a phase of where companies are trying to do everything on their own to now a phase where they're collaborating very closely across their value chains to make change happen, to make some of these systemic changes that are needed happen. And for my key message, I think, going forward, reflects a little bit what we've been hearing earlier, which is that business can work across the value chain, but moving forward to get to where we need to from a climate change perspective, business absolutely has to work with government and government has to work with business as well. So we represent a lot of companies and um, a couple of the key themes that we're seeing uh, where we're seeing some very positive progress are of course on the energy side of things and as well as the transport side. At the moment we already have you know over just about 400 companies um, around the world who represent um, the, the equivalent of, of ener electricity demand uh, just a little bit larger than the UK. So that's a huge amount of electricity demand and consumption that these companies represent under RE100, which is uh, led by the climate group together with uh, CDP. And what they've been doing is working again with other organizations like the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, you know, and in Europe in particular with uh, Wind Europe and Solar Power for Europe to drive the European Union's ambition on legislation. And we've been big supporters of the progressive voice um, in, in Europe. And I think we've seen some, some excellent moves in the right forward, which has basically unlocked the power of corporate procurement of renewables to really push the wave after what you know um, governments did in terms of putting in things like feed-in tariffs. So we've seen great momentum and exponential growth on the renewables side. And, and uh, we've heard some great examples already from Nina, um, but maybe just to mention a couple, you know, you've got companies like Unilever or Signify who already in 2020 were running their full operations on 100% renewables. The other topic that I'd like to raise is, is, is mobility. And we've seen a lot of activity in the passenger electric vehicle market. Um, EV100 has 129 companies that are helping to push the envelope and also advocate for more progressive policies in Europe and elsewhere. Um, and we've got companies like, like Volvo, who've committed to becoming a fully electric car company, you know, by 2030. Um, and also going beyond just, you know, the actual drivetrain, but looking at the embodied emissions um, in the vehicle as well, working with companies like SSAB uh, for fossil free steel. So we're seeing a lot of uptake of the technologies that will help us decarbonize. Um, and I'd say the next chapter, and, and this again reflects what we've heard comments earlier, is probably moving into other sectors as well, particularly heavy industry. There is now a competition about where these plants and jobs and, and essentially tax income is going to be located in the future. And it's only by business being able to work with governments that we can really unlock those investments that companies need to, uh, to make in these countries. Now, I'd say that you know we have some great examples from some leading companies, um, but really if we're honest about the situation when we look globally at the global emissions, emissions are actually still rising, even while we're seeing exponential growth in some of the um, some of the solutions. So that's why I think that um, a key role that organizations like us and the ones we work with need to have working with the EU government is really to push further and faster, not just for the leaders who have been unlocking some of these particular barriers, but also to bring the millions of companies who are or starting or in the middle of their climate journey as well. And so three key things that are still needed um, in Europe is that we absolutely have to have a 100% decarbonized power system in place by 2020, 2035. At the same time, we can't have any new coal development or financing and also phase out coal power generation by 2030. And then finally, of course, a big piece of this and where the legislators have a huge um, opportunity as well is to phase out all of the fossil fuel subsidies by 2025. That's the only way we can make the, the equation match in terms of what we're seeing on the emissions actually still increasing, increasing globally. So that's a key role. Um, I'd say one other thing which hasn't been mentioned yet, mm -hmm. which I'd love to mention, which is just that, of course, we want to work closely with 
EU legislators on the EU um, um, portfolio. But at the same time, we have to recognize that the EU, as sustainability leaders, have a key role in the international um, uh, environment as well. And the EU can play a huge role in forums like the UNFCCC, G7, G20, and pushing that international ambition forward as well. Because it's with this international piece, as well as the more domestic or regional EU piece, that uh, we can create clarity um, and, and predictable legislative environments that will speed up the pace and the size of the investments that companies can and will make. Thank you, Ursula. Um, and let me apologize. I understand we've had um, uh, connectivity issues and indeed an electricity cut, which has uh, um, uh, meant Ursula can't uh, be seen or heard anymore. Um, with that, um, uh, thank you, Erasmus. And I suggest that, that we pass uh, to our next speaker. Um, and if uh, Gonzalo is able to, uh, to connect with us still, which I hope you are, then we pass over straight to uh, to you. So, Gonzalo, in the hope that you are not cut off, um, welcome. Nice to see you. Uh, in you more ways much. than one, indeed. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin. And good morning to everyone from from Madrid. It's a real pleasure to participate in this extremely interested and needed conversation. So, from the Spanish Green Growth Group. I want to share with you some, some messages. Uh, we are facing several crises at the same time. The climate crisis, the economic crisis, energy crisis, biodiversity crisis. So the origin of all these crises is an energy model based on fossil fuels. And the solution to all of them is to replace urgently fossil fuels with renewable energy. First, developing more renewables in the power sector as a ways to decarbonize electricity, but also to replace fossil fuels in other sectors through electrification, such as transport or buildings. So, 70% of the economy can be decarbonized with these measures that are already competitive. And second, where electrification is not possible, green hydrogen, we will need green hydrogen with incentives for production and demand to scale up and reduce its cost. So by replacing fossil fuels with renewables, with reinforced renewable targets in the renewable directive, this is extremely important, we will improve competitiveness so reduction of energy bills, we will promote industrial development, create sustainable jobs, contribute to energy security. So this is a huge opportunity. So we are seeing very good news. So we have clean technology revolution and cost reduction, and not just in renewables, also in batteries, in heat pumps, in green hydrogen. Second, the energy crisis is accelerating the transition. So to improve energy security, to meet climate commitments, and to lead the new economy from an industrial policy perspective. The third thing, positive development, is that the International Energy Agency predicts that the peak of fossil fuels would be reached within this decade. And finally, some companies are committed we are taking action, like the companies in the Copolis Group, in the Spanish Green Group, group. We are taking action. We are delivering solutions. But it's also true that others are putting spokes in the wheel. But the increase, this increased acceleration with the current policy framework is not enough. We must reduce emissions drastically. So our view is that the technology exists, companies are ready to invest, the financial sector is ready to finance. What we need is to scale climate-friendly solutions. 
And to this aim is key to four things. I think is the first is to promote inform information and awareness among people. So it is essential that people understand why the energy transition is being undertaken and what the benefits and implications are. The second thing is that we need to set robust policies and regulation at national and European level that accelerate the transition in renewables, electric vehicles, heat pumps, industries. The fourth thing is we need to reinforce regulatory instability. So we must never lose sight of the long term. Short term decisions that are needed must be aligned with long term objectives and should be based on a robust internal market. And finally, to streamline administrative procedures and permitting from clean energy and clean infrastructures. As a final remark, I want to highlight that moving towards an ambition emission reduction pathways and accelerating the energy transition is urgent and is possible, but it's not easy. So in this respect, we think it's necessary to work in alliances. We are fully already engaged with a wide variety of multi-stakeholder alliances with environmental NGOs, with industries, but we will continue and strengthen our work in alliances that we think are fundamental. Not only are they important, but are the only way in our perspective to move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ursula. Thank you so much, Gonzalo, and apologies, everybody. And interestingly, in an energy discussion, my electricity just cut and has just returned. So, yes, well, I guess this is the, the challenges that we have at the moment. Um, so thank you so much. I'd like to move to Andre Boresh. Thank you from Velat and uh, also from a business network in the in the change called Change for the Better from the Czech Republic. Please go ahead, Andre. Yeah, thank you very much, Ursula. Uh, good morning, everyone. As you may know, I'm representing here the region uh, which is not known as the biggest supporter of Green Deal or generally the green transition. But still, we have a lot of companies that see uh, the huge opportunities in the green transition. But in the past, we needed an organization that would put together fragmented companies. Actually, the idea uh, we started with, uh, with the discussion of the idea uh, during the far first wave of COVID. Uh, you all remember those times, uh, huge uncertainties, uh, risk there, risk there, um, everywhere was dangerous, etc. And also our governments uh, were working on protective measures also for business. And we felt that we should not focus only on protecting protecting of current traditional business, but with, that we should take it as an opportunity, that we should support the transition and the transition of our economic in more sustainable way. Uh, we also know that uh, the government needs a partner, needed a partner among the business because, uh, yeah, Czech Republic is known by well known for traditional business, I would say more carbon intensive business, etc. And also outside the uh, Czech Republic, uh, we felt that, for example, European Parliament and European Co Commission would appreciate to have a partner in this region that would support the, those ideas of uh, green transition and green deal. We, of course, know as a business that we should act uh, and we should start acting ourselves. Uh, this, that is why we uh, try to inspire uh, in the organization our members, uh, but not only other members inside that organization, but also to be inspiration for uh, other stakeholders. We signed a lot of members, uh, sorry, partnerships and agreements with other companies to find a way and solutions how to decrease our carbon footprint and uh, our carbon emissions generally, I would say. Uh, we also started a lot of cooperation with uh, 
universities and non-governmental organizations, it is also key for finding uh, so solutions. Uh, but we also need as a business to inspire our customers and not only our partners, but our customers to and provide them with solutions. So we started to show them how they can, for example, renovate their houses and homes in sustainable way, how they can decrease um, the amount the amount of waste. We try to provide them with uh, uh, with the products with uh, low lower um, carbon intense lower intensive products uh, we also try to help them with the waste from our products etc so we need to provide and we want to provide also our customers with the solutions and help them to decrease their impact on their on the environment of course on this way we need also help from the government and i'm not talking about um, establishing the business environment in more uh, sustainable way or rem about removing obstacles and berries but I'm mainly speaking about the holistic approach as an example uh, I would mention here the current revision of EPBD uh, we all know that the main goal is to decrease energy um, energy sorry improve energy efficiency not to decrease it but improve it but for us and for people in europe it's a huge opportunity to improve also their comfort their uh, um, living quality etc because in europe still 80 million people live in uh, unhealthy conditions and renovation of their homes it's a huge opportunity how to improve the air, indoor air quality to increase the amount of daylight etc so we should utilize this possibility and not only focus on one aspect of this process but only but still keep in mind other aspects of our policies so to sum it up, I think and I believe that crucial for the successful transition is cooperation and inspiration. And certainly it is the holistic approach of our policies. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. And I can only echo the need for this collaboration as we move forward. Uh, Anna, Anna Strunebrega from uh, Slovenia. Um, if you would like to join us and also give your perspective uh, from from this region and um, Anna is the CEO of this of CR Energy Sustainable Business Network a uh, group of progressive companies and organizations in Slovenia and we've worked a, very closely on a number of files in the period be interested in, in your perspective go ahead thank you Ursula um, for this uh, uh, invitation to this great event uh, it was really interesting to hear or all previous speakers, uh, big companies and policies, but uh, I will speak today mostly in the name of the SMEs, because SMEs in Europe um, represent 99% of enterprises in Europe and probably also globally. Uh, they uh, are huge contributor to economic growth and they employ two thirds of uh, employees in Europe. They also have uh, quite a big uh, impact on, um, on the environment. That's why it's important also for them to understand um, uh, the situation and to put the ambition on higher level. But they do need help because small companies actually, they do not have sustainability managers or teams. Uh, they lack capacities uh, to follow this legislative tsunami um even to read all these documents they lack of uh, finance to invest in green technologies because their primary job is probably um, uh, many times something else not energy efficiency renewables uh, using these technologies so they they need help on this transition uh, i can say that they are also facing more and more pressures from the banks because the banks have to decarbonize their portfolio and they have to uh, report about the intensity and also the taxonomy is coming which is more and more important 
many companies still do not understand why why is it how how it works how to calculate and um so the problem for the companies is to innovate new business models to innovate new products and services uh, according to one of the last um, studies that we got in Slovenia, 89% uh, of the companies in industry, they still have products that are older than 10 years. So, um, and they make more than 50% of profit from these products. So in seven years, because of new standards, these uh, products will be prop probably uh, out of stock because uh, it will not be possible to uh, sell them anymore. So uh, what we see is that these companies need help uh, and to work with bigger companies uh, more intensively. So they also need a clear and stable policy uh, to understand that it's safe to go on this road to, uh, to get financial support, to get um, uh advice is how to do it and uh, the other thing is that organizations like we and uh haga initiatives and others that we are in this network uh we can help them translating into simply simply uh, more simplified versions frameworks so in cr we decided to uh make um a certificate for esg rating and climate action of the companies it's like um a fast test like it was in COVID. you you went if you could go through a fast test or pcr test so we decided to make a fast test for the companies to go through the questionnaire which is based on the international frameworks and standards for ESG uh, rating and also EU regulation. And what we noticed is uh, that when we start asking them about uh, the goals on the ESG, they said, because many times marketing departments were responsible for giving us the answers, they said, okay, we need, we cannot write this by ourselves. We need our CEO or financial directors to decide what are our goals and what actions will we take. And the next interesting thing was that uh, actually the movement became inside the companies uh, engaging employees, uh, raising competencies, and finding new partners um, for these um, changes um, of the business models, finding new solutions. And we are really glad uh, we keep this optimistic uh, movement that uh, yes. changes can be done, but um, we have to um, know the... Um, yeah environment raise ambitions work with the policy makers but really help companies to go on this transition raise the competencies and uh, keep positive even though we are a little bit skeptic if we can achieve the goals by 2030 but every step counts we need to yeah indeed every step counts thank you so thank much you. for providing the sme uh, viewpoint anna I'll bring in Ruth quickly, Ruth Reichstein, to respond to all of this. I know she doesn't have so much time. I think she's on uh, on uh, on audio, but Ruth is joining us. Uh, for an idea. Hello, Ruth, can you hear us? Um, Ruth, I think we may have to cut you off, unfortunately. I feel like uh, all we can hear is um, trial version coming through. Um, Perhaps it'd be great if we could have your comments. We could if maybe if you send them over, I could put them in the concluding remarks if you can hear me. Um, in which case, I think uh, perhaps what we could do is move to the next session. Uh, so I think broadly what we've heard from a, a number of, of, of the panelists is really the support for unlocking the transition, some questions about how exactly we do it, but the real need for alliances and, and for the long-term perspective. Um, what we can move to next is a question about more about the session, how we look at the competitive sustainability of the EU's economy and industry and, and how we can, can really um, improve this. So I'm, I'm happy to welcome Martin Porter, my colleague at CISL, the executive chair of the Brussels office, to discuss more the question of competitiveness and, and how climate action and the mobilisation of green investments can increase the competitiveness of EU industry. 
Thank you, Ursula. And uh, I hope that um, uh, technology will allow this to, to run smoothly. Um, this is obviously a topic which has um, risen very rapidly to the top of the EU political agenda, and several other speakers have referenced this uh, before. In particular, the announcement made by uh, President von der Leyen about a Green Deal industry plan and associated Net Zero Industry Act and all of the elements that, that go with that, which um, I'd like to give just a, a couple of minutes of uh, context about before then offering a few thoughts on, on key areas in which the discussion about it and the follow up to it, um, I think will we'll, uh, benefit from a, a focus, including the sort of discussions that we've had uh, today. Um, I guess uh, by way of context, obviously the discussion has been triggered, as several have said, by uh, the action of the US um, and its Inflation Reduction Act provisions uh, centered on promoting many of the uh, clean and uh, climate neutral activities that we've been discussing uh, here, which in itself uh, is, is very welcome. And the uh, European Council, as a consequence of that, called for a strategy to promote competitiveness and productivity as, as a result of that. Um, what is a key as uh, an element of that response that we have seen is that the Green Deal is providing the strategic compass for that competitiveness strategy. And quite rightly so, if we look at the tests the EU has undergone uh, in the past two or three years, uh, starting with COVID, obviously more recently with the um, uh, aggression uh, towards Ukraine, uh, and now a wider economic uh, uh, crisis, um, the Green Deal has shown that it is enabling a response which integrates uh, the different uh, needs that we have in a way which delivers increased resilience, uh, energy security and action on, on climate change, and therefore also benefits uh, European competitiveness. And that should continue. So it's quite right that that provides the uh, strategic basis for uh, this new strategy. Um, we're also uh, well aware now of the fact that what the US has done is underline the fact that what the EU has been seeking to do uh, since 2015 and indeed before in leading this uh, transition is to catalyze exactly this type of action. Um, it is indeed welcome that the US has taken this uh, strong action now, and it's not the only country, of course, to be doing so. So the EU's response needs to uh, take into account not just the US action, but obviously a global acceleration. And indeed, in what we're now seeing is a race um, to secure the sorts of climate neutral uh, economic benefits that we have been arguing for and that many of the businesses involved in this have been pursuing uh, for some time. Um, that race has obviously uh, hotted up and we're seeing much more competition as a result of that. And the size of this uh, market opportunity, the IEA recently underlined, um, is enormous. Um, so how does the EU currently stand in relation to that race and what should it do uh, to benefit from it? Well, um, how it stands in that race um, should not be a matter of um, uh, starting from zero. There is much that the EU has done over the recent past in its uh, strategy for competitive sustainability, which actually positions it very well. Uh, we have uh, released a, an index recently which looks to try to assess its performance in this respect. And in many areas of the competitive performance in this transition, the EU is doing much of what it needs to. Um, so the basis and the starting point it is um, uh, looking at this new uh, plan from um, has many strong elements on which it should build. Um, if I would um, highlight a few things where we need to, to focus now in just a, a couple of minutes uh, more, I think one area that um, in a strategy of competitive sustainability that should not be forgotten, uh, forgotten, of course, is the fact that we need collaboration. Not only is climate and sustainability obviously a global uh, issue, it's also something that requires common rules and collaboration as much as the dynamic of competition. Uh, negotiation with the US to solve some of the issues that have arisen and partnerships for innovation and much beyond are obviously also essential in addition to the competitive dynamic which we're, we're seeing. So the first thing is to underline the need for those types of collaborative as well as competitive dynamics to be uh, secured. 
The second is to make sure that we keep our eyes on the longer term, the strategic competitiveness dynamic here, as much as the short yes. term. Um, that short term need obviously, uh, to some extent, focuses on energy related issues, but the longer term competitive uh, needs are ones that the, uh, the strategy has to emphasize at the same time. The third is that we see that there is a need um, not just for scale of investment um, and innovation, um, but for pace. The more that this strategy is uh, unlocking EU ability to do this urgently and rapidly, the better. And there are discussions obviously about state aid, uh, new sovereignty fund and so on. Pace uh -huh. as much as scale is key. And then lastly, um, I would say that um, clearly skills is an important dimension here. That was mentioned mm -hmm. by uh, President von der Leyen. Uh, the social as much as the economic component of this strategy is, is crucial. Um, it's a bottleneck to the ability of the EU to scale up quickly, but it's also a social imperative. Uh, and the just transition is key to keep in mind whilst we're securing the competitive benefits of the transition. So as principles for this strategy, I hope that those are good starting points. And I'm sure that the businesses who will now speak will offer much of the example uh, that we need to, to draw inspiration from as we uh, go about this strategy. So Ursula, back to you. I hope that sets the scene. Thank you, Martin. Thank you for setting the scene. Um, so uh, from this, we'd like to, to go to Sabine Nalinger, the, the Managing Director of Stiftung Klimawirtschaft, which is um, a climate initiative of CEOs, managing directors and family entrepreneurs based in Germany. I'm sure you have some, um, some really uh, important thoughts on, on what Martin has said and, and how you see it from, from the German perspective. Uh, Sabine, over to you, please. Yeah, thank you so much, Ursula, for your kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it's uh, my great pleasure to join you for this timely roundtable today. And as the previous speakers has emphasized, this event comes at a, I would say, key moment in time. Last week at the World Economic Forum in Davos, EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen announced a Green Deal industrial plan as a European response to the significant dependency in crucial clean technologies from China and also the US Inflation Reduction Act. And the Fit for 55 negotiations are about to coming to an end. Major decisions like the revision of the ETS system have been taken last December. And other major dossiers such as the Renewable Energy Directive are still being discussed and are expected to be finalized by the end of March this year. And not to forget the still ongoing energy crisis triggered by Russian aggression against Ukraine. Uh, Martin just mentioned it, which is not only causing unbearable suffering, but putting our entire European economy and enormous pressure. And we at the Stiftung Klimawirtschaft, the German CEO Alliance for Climate and Economy, we are eager to play our part in this system. As a cross-sectoral CEO alliance of 32 major German companies, we engage in these important debates by bringing first together ambitious companies with policymakers. And we provide for a sounding board for innovative ideas for the transformation towards climate neutrality and facilitate a platform for exchange among different stakeholders. I would say our companies stick to their climate targets and transition plans despite the current energy and geopolitical crisis. Things are now in motion that cannot be undone. And the question is not longer. If the question is now how quickly we will transfer our economy towards a net zero, not only to stay within the limit of 1.5 degrees global warming, but also for Europe to be the front runner for innovation and preserve our industries. The reality is 
we have now entered the race to net zero in which the winner will be retain a competitive economic advance for decades, not for the next years, for decades. And so the crucial moment, it is the European industry that is struggling the most with regards to the current high energy prices. Both China and the US risk to overtake us as leaders in the green transition at a moment when we actually want to increase our domestic industrial capacities and re reduce our dependencies. This is the right moment, I would say, for the EU to pick up speed in the race to the top for decarbonization. And the good news are we have the technologies needed for transformation. We have the companies committed to go all the way to the way to net zero. The European and German companies are the front runners in developing smart solutions for, for example, energy storages, efficiency, electrification and renewable energy. And our industrial companies, for instance, from the steel plant, from cement or chemical sectors, are leading the development of green basic materials. They invest in green technology and in building the necessary capacity for solar and wind energy, hydrogen and other critical technologies for the green transformation. And what we need now is the right framework to implement these technologies. Access to cheap renewable energy, I think it's a major point, and green hydrogen will determine the attractiveness for our companies for investing in the European economy. And it, it, it is essential to overcome the current barriers by accelerating the development of renewable energy, by scaling up a European hydrogen market, by speeding up permitting processes and by providing the necessary funding, not only for innovation and capex, but also for de development, sorry about that, and OPEX costs. So what we need is now to support yes. our industry and develop an effective European industrial strategy, not just since the Inflation Reduction Act has increased the pressure on Europe to act faster now and more decisive to support our industrial transformation. We have now to make use of this moment. It's a real moment now to accelerate the green transformation. So we welcome the Commission President's proposal of a net zero industry act that we will support the scaling of clean technology in Europe. The new industrial and sovereignty strategy has to stimulate investments and accelerate the transformation significantly. For that, we need, I would say, three things. First, we need more flexibility in supporting the industrial transformation by adapting state rail rules. Second, we have to preserve yes. the integrity of our European single market through Europe-wide funding instruments. And third, for all this, the implementation to be much faster and much more pragmatic than it may have been in the past. So, EU Commissioner Terry Breton and Margaret Festegger have put forward promising proposals such mm -hmm. uh, as revising EU state aid rules or setting up a new sovereignty fund. We now urgently need, I would say, a holistic European strategy for sustainable competitiveness coupled with the right incentive mechanism to accelerate innovation investments and industrial production capacity for clean energies. And at last, we need to find the right balance mm -hmm. between competition and cooperation yes. in Europe and with our partners. And so, uh, Ursula, in this spirit, there's no time to lose on implementation. Let's jointly make sure to walk the talk. And thank you. And I'm looking forward for the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sabina. And I think this point on implementation is absolutely critical. I know this is one of the things that Ruth wanted to bring in earlier as well, that now we have to move to implementation. So 
if we could move also to, to Björn now, Björn ha Karen Hageland, who's the chief executive officer for the Student Business Leaders. Um, he um, uh, would like, he would bring a, a view from Norway, in fact, about how to stimulate these green investments, which is part of the, um, part of how we implement and part of how we move forward. So please go ahead, Björn. Thank you. And thank you for all the introduction and thank you for you who are part of EU who are driving this progress forward. Uh, so now you will hear a peaceful uh, voice from, from Norway. And in that respect, I would say and remind us that in order to succeed on the climate change agenda, uh, we will have to collaborate with US. We will have to collaborate with China because we cannot fight our way to a global decarbonization of the world. We will only succeed together. So, so that is just the, the, the setting from, from our side. Um, in order to stimulate the green investments, uh, it's three priorities which we here in Norway work with our government to do that is to set clear priorities to communicate the targets well ahead so the business sector can adapt uh, and then obviously put in instruments that facilitate the, the transition shift is working with 60 of the norwegian climate leaders which are progressive working together to collaborate and share uh, inspiration and knowledge and definitely also working very uh, close with our government. And we have three priorities we work with our governments on. First and foremost, to set up price on emission. Secondly, to really use the public procurement um, facility to uh, uh, um, facilitate for more green markets for, for Norwegian uh, business sector and thirdly to enforce um, climate reporting in the sense that we would like to see uh, climate reporting at the same level as fin financial reporting. We have to count carbon as we count money. So, so that is the three priorities we are working on. And then I would closing by just bring forward a few examples on how this play out in, in practical. So, so Norway have decided uh, a stepwise um, increase of the CO2 price to 200 euro in 2030. So, so that is a broad political agreement on, and that means that the business sector is has predictability on how we will uh, accommodate that increase in, in carbon pricing and that is essential to drive the transition of the Norwegian economy. Secondly, um, we have today 80% of our new electric cars are electric. The government have said by 2025 it will not be allowed to sell uh, fossil fuel cars in Norway. So we will reach 100%. Probably we will reach that target before 2025. So my point is to set this very clear target, uh, we we do the shift very rapidly. I, I just heard the EU target to be 2035. I will encourage you to speed up that transition. Thirdly, uh, for the shipping sector, the government has set target of uh, banning um, uh, fossil fuel ships into the World Heritage Fjords by 2026. That was done a couple of years back, meaning that the industry are now developing all the solutions in order to meet that target. And finally, uh, in Norway we have uh, around 200 ferries, which is crucial for our infrastructure. Again, we we do together with the government and their public procurement procedures set zero emission target for, for new ferries coming into the market. And by today, we have half of the ferry fully electric, meaning 80 fully electric ferries in, in Norway. So I will just end my note by, by that. 
set clear priorities, set clear targets a little bit ahead of time, and then work with uh, public procurement and other facilities in order to drive the investments in the right direction. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bjorn. Um, so that was a really interesting view from Norway as to how this is working on the ground. If I could bring in Yvonne and Peter to respond to the discussion, um, that would be great. Yvonne, um, are you there? And Peter Wittuk, who is from the, uh, the Belgian Climate Change Department. Yvonne, do you have some comments? I know we've covered a lot of ground. Um, it'd be great to hear some of the things that have you know, come across to you in, this, in these discussions. <laughs> Yeah, thanks Ursula and thanks for giving me the opportunity again to, to comment a little bit on what we've been hearing. Uh, it's been extremely uh, interesting and of course also very reassuring to hear, but you have the progressive business in your event. Uh, uh, there may be others out there that uh, you know do see challenges and, and have concerns and anxiety maybe every now and then. I heard uh, Anna from Slovenia saying, mm, can we make it in seven years? So. Of course, it, there is a challenge, but we, we are very, very happy to have uh, the front runners uh, to lead the way. I think uh, Pascal Canfin was also saying, you know, if we can show in specific cases that things work and that people are, you know, uh, investing and, and making the effort to see how to do this, of course, in conjunction with, you know, specific policies that, that, that give that predictability and that give the support, um, that will for sure make the difference in terms of, you know, um, convincing everybody else. And that is within Europe, but also globally. So I was very happy to hear, you know, that uh, there is almost a full consensus that there needs to be this cooperation, uh, collaboration, let's say, between companies. Um, but what Andre was saying was also very interesting, you know, uh, within your supply chain, within your value chain. I think others were saying it. Uh, Anna as well in terms of you know SMEs taking them on board um, because that is what we really need in order to you know bring everybody on board and, and make this uh, just transition. I very much also agree that you know we need to um, communicate better on on the different benefits and I think this is still because sometimes people also perceive you know the targets etc as being imposed um, and they indeed raise all these you know concerns and threats and uh the materials aren't there the workforce isn't there but it is about you know how do we uh make the necessary steps in order to get there and that's where i do think that you know um this cooperation also with with governments and with other authorities and i think the public procurement uh, uh points that um um let me just see where was i uh yeah, that Bjorn was just making is also a very important one. And I think we need to look at that also in the context of uh, our industrial uh, uh, competitiveness plan at EU level to see what can be done there. I think you may have noticed that uh, in the whole um, negotiations on, on uh, cars, but also on, well, heavy duty vehicles, as I said, is for a little bit later. But I mean, there is consideration also about, you know, uh, maybe putting in place some measures that could stimulate uh, the corporate uh, car fleets to to move towards uh, more electrical vehicles or let's say low emission vehicles. Um, so these are very very important reflections. And for me, it is all about you know um, tapping into your know-how because listening to to all of us this morning, I'm again of the impression that you know we know what you know we know what we need to do. We know how you know bleak uh, uh, our future will be if we don't do it. Um, within Europe, but also if we don't manage to 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 inspire the rest of the world, um, staying at the top of this race, <laughs> indeed, uh, as um, as Sabine was just saying, um, it will not be a very rosy situation, both in terms of competitiveness, but also in terms of you know our own uh, prosperity, you know, the, the social impacts, the health impacts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think by that, all, all that by now is known. There are very few people who actually contest that, but it is really the question around the how, you know, uh, the short time frame we have, the need to showcase this how, and again, you know, crucial to have uh, all these companies explaining to us and them in these alliances taking on board the others uh, that this is feasible and what are the requirements needed from governments, from policy, from uh, funding instruments, et cetera, et cetera, in order to speed this up. Uh, so I think it has been an extremely uh, interesting uh, session. Lots Thank more you. to be done. 
<laughs> yes. But that is also clear. I just wanted to flag, we have a few, um, how shall I call it, initiatives also at EU level where we would be keen to uh, get more involvement from, from companies. And uh, I wanted to draw your attention to the Climate Pact, which is where we work with, you know, um, people in all the member states who can convey all these messages, who can reach out to citizens, who can tap into uh, solutions that are there on the ground and multiply, you know, again, also in terms of, you know, people's uh, awareness, understanding, visibility of solutions, etc. So that will be very useful if we can work uh, with you on that. There will be a, a high level event. It's the 1st of February, so that's next week, uh, online and, and physical event. Um, I can send the link if anybody wants. Um, and then we have these missions under the big uh, research program of the EU, so Horizon Europe. We have a mission on um, on climate neutral cities, huh, where by 2030 we have a whole set of cities that have signed up to become climate neutral. But of course, they're also like, you know, still in the process of seeing, okay, well, how do I do this? How do I tap the different funds? How do I get the necessary uh, uh, policy tools in place? And also oh, a mission yes. on adaptation and resilience. So there again, by 2030, how far can we be in making sure that all the necessary investments at the same time ensure climate resilience? Because whatever we do in terms of speeding up emission reductions, of course, we already see the impact of climate happening. Um, so yeah, we uh, are very happy to to tap into your know-how, to work with you and with the member states, you know, to, to really make this happen, speed up and uh, make sure we can move on to the next step, which is again, you know, next targets, uh, uh, you know, and we continue on that basis. I'll leave it there for now. Thanks. Thanks, Yvonne. And feel free to drop the link in the big chat. That would be fine. And OK, so Peter, I thank you for your patience. I know there's been a huge set of discussions and, and Peter is joining us um, from the, the climate change de department in the in Belgium. And of course, your presidency is also not so far off as well. But um, what, what, what are your views on the discussion that so far uh, been taking place? Yes. Good. Good. Good morning. Well, let, let me thank you first for inviting me uh, to this uh, this well very interesting um, conversation. Um, very useful as, as well to to note uh, what is is living with uh, the front runners, the progressives in industry in Europe. Uh, also in anticipation of our of our presidency of the European Union, which is indeed um, um, uh, advancing at a quick pace. I would say we're starting in 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 less than a less than a year. But um, I, I don't really have much to add to, to the conversation content-wise. So, so let me just um, share a, a number of things that, that struck struck me. Um, we've, we've been focusing to, um, to a large extent, and I think we have reason to be optimistic there on um, developments um, over the last couple of years under the von der Leyen um, Legislator uh, Commission on 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 uh, what's happening within the European Union, and I think we we have good reasons to be to be very optimistic. With all that's been going on, Yvonne uh, went into into uh, into detail on 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 well this a success that I would have thought I've been around for a couple of decades now in terms of climate policy. Um, five years ago, I would have thought that would be uh, totally uh, impossible. So I, that's reason to be very optimistic, I think, uh, both in terms of our, our contribution to, to the climate transition and also in terms of, of, of um, the competitiveness of um, EU companies, many of which are, are indeed um, front uh, runners, but not every not everyone yet, of course. And then the whole policy framework with Fit for 55, Repower, the European Climate Law, um, uh, the resource and resilience facility, but also the, the whole framework around um, sustainable finance. I think uh, will be will be um, will, be, will provide me enough reassurances to remain optimistic um, uh, there. Uh, but um, there is, as as one of the speakers said, also reason not to be uh, overconfidently uh, optimistic because the European Union, uh, that's a good thing in a way, only represents less than 10% of worldwide uh, emissions, and they are still on, on the rise. Um, science tells us in the recent IPCC report um, to be able to not exceed the one and a half um, a degree uh, uh, rise in temperature, uh, emissions globally have to peak uh, before, well before 2025, that's in two years time. Um, that's one thing. Um, the other thing is that um, 
and that's probably caused by by the poly crisis we're in um, right right now um, that we've seen I'm also involved in the international negotiations at, at Sharm el Sheikh uh, notably that there is huge and before that there is still huge resistance uh, against um, political messages headline messages which are basically common knowledge in terms of well where we have to go things like um, phasing out of fossil fuels that proved to be impossible at Sharm, at Sharm el Sheikh, uh, even though India had proposed it, even though 80 countries, including the EU and the US major actors uh, were in favor, uh, that kind of political headline messages uh, are still impossible to agree upon on the international level. And that is, that is worrying, uh, of course, because there we're talking about the other 90% of worldwide, uh, worldwide uh, emissions. Um, preceded by, for example, the, the G20 uh, late summer 20, 2022 being unable to to um, to repeat what was agreed upon in Glasgow as regards the 1.5 uh, ta target. Um, a good thing um, I heard about, I, I learned about actually uh, through this meeting mainly is that we're now in a situation where we are in a in a race. Um, caused by by the the inflation reduction uh, act a race to attract green investments between the eu and and the united states and and hopefully other uh, major economies worldwide uh, as well um that, has, that is a big challenge but i think is a reason to be optimistic uh, as well in terms of getting the whole globalized economy uh, on board um getting the whole globalized economy to respect the the often forgotten thirds uh, objective of the Paris Agreement to to align all uh, all finance flows uh, with the temperature objectives, the objective to be um, to be climate resilient, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, um, since um, well, we're gathered here between government representatives and representatives of of businesses. Um, I, I I I have a question for for debate. Basically, we heard Pascal Canfin uh, state how um, how instrumental um, front runner businesses. Uh, have been uh, in agreeing notably on the two dossiers he mentioned, uh, CO2 cars and, and uh, what was it, important uh, def deforestation. Um, so I think an interesting reflection would be um, is how European companies, um, through, of course, um, extending their market share globally can 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 contribute to a, a, a more well less global resistance against the climate transition but also in terms of their their role as international actors uh, more more generally that's that's a question i think um, we should ask ourselves um, there was a lot of ado about the presence of fossil fuel lobbies in sharm uh, el sheikh but many, many other companies are there as well, and they are showcasing, and they are they are present in in that forum. But they don't seem to have the same impact on uh, what's happening globally than the 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 the, the mentioned uh, representatives of the um, of the fossil fuel uh, industry. So that's that's a question I basically have for reflection uh, to 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 um, to you um, people. Um, one element that is um, crucial, I think, also when we reflect about the role of business uh, in the climate transition, um, and which is not only crucial in terms of, of the social imperative, as someone called it, um, just transition, but it's also uh, something we have to deal with if we don't want to create uh, a bottleneck for uh, a, a sustainably competitive um, uh, European, uh, European industry. Um, and that is the matter of just transition, uh, jobs, um, uh, upskilling and reskilling. I think that is something that would require uh, a lot of focus uh, as well. Uh, it, it will, by the way, be, be one of the uh, priorities of our own uh, presidency, and I'll end with highlighting a couple of a couple of those. Um, it's still early days, of course, to to be able to give you any further any further details. Um, but um, also um, priorities like the one on, on, on reflecting on the European Union's uh, industry strategy, I think, becomes uh, well closer to the centre, I would say, of our political radar now well, that we're reflecting on the presidency, especially with the announced um, Net Zero Industry Act uh, and, 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 and other elements of, of that uh, package. Um, and um, we will be looking also at... Um, the circular economy, the transition towards a circular economy, which is which is um, essential 
um, in many, many uh, uh, aspects uh, to be able to realize the, the climate transition. Um, I would also flag um, uh, the, the link with uh, biodiversity that was raised by a couple of, uh, of the speakers and then to end um, also say that um, would come as no surprise. We are a, an SME um, uh, economy to a very large extent as many European countries. Um, we would also be looking um, at a revision of the SME strategy um, also in this broader context, I hope, of the, of the climate transition. And I'll end there and thank you again for giving me this opportunity. Yeah, thank you, Peter. I don't know, Yvonne, if you have any comments on this. I think one thing I would just say is we had Ruth, Ruth's comments earlier um, that she couldn't make. And one of the things she really said was they will be talking a lot about the Inflation Reduction Act and the, the, the Green Deal net industry plan, net zero industry plan that is coming. But what we're going to hear in the next few weeks is really before February, even before the European uh, Special Council in February, will be simply speed up and invest. So do work simply, speed up and invest. And really uh, the real need for a lot of different implementation. Um, I mean, I don't know, Yvonne, if you'd like to, to respond to any of the points that, that Peter made there. Thanks, uh, Ursula. And thanks, Peter. Um, very points, uh, very pertinent points. Um, as you said, Ursula, yes, uh, and again, it links back to what I was saying before. I think there is no question on the what. You know, people know they need to invest. They, they, there is this, I think, fairly broadly shared desire in society to to act. Uh, but there are all these bottlenecks. So how do we do it? And I think the the uh, simplification and the speeding up notion is uh, is also broadly supported, and that's what we will be looking at in this, uh, you know, industrial plan. At the same time, uh, it does still have a dimension of acceptability. And I think what Peter was saying and others as well before, Bjorn, et cetera, it's, you know, the, the visibility of the solutions is still, um, you know, can still be improved. Um, yes, we look at Norway in terms of, you know, what they're doing in terms of electrical vehicles, but people say, ah, oh, that can't be replicated in Romania or in Bulgaria. Um, although, of course, there are an enormous amount of funds. Uh, I just wrote in the chat, but not to all, but between the, the panelists that, you know, for example, there is a European social fund. And, and, and here is, of course, where member states should target the money of, in that fund towards preparing uh, uh, the workforce for these new skills that are required. And you kind of would have expected that this was already clear quite a few years ago and that therefore in the plans this would have come through. But what we see when we look at it, I mean, this is, of course, led by DG Employment, but we don't see it. So there still seems to be a disconnect, you know, in terms of uh, what is needed, what is feasible and, and bringing all this together. I heard a lot of your speakers talk about the holistic approach. I very much agree. Um, Peter, I was wondering, and of course you have your, your view towards uh, the presidency and that is of course very, very uh, good and useful, but also as a member state, I mean, you, you probably have uh, uh, views on, you know, um, what does it take? Um, the long term versus the short term, you know, how do we talk about, yes, energy security right now, but nevertheless uh, promote and support uh, these, these more mid to long term uh, investments. I think from the side of the EU, um, for example, we, we deal with uh, uh, one of these funds and that is the, the, the innovation fund uh, that is funded by, by revenues from, from the ETS. So we see excellent uh, proposals by the energy intensive industry coming forward. It will be first of a kind pro uh, projects, but they can be scaled up. It can be replicated, of course, until they have become commercially uh, viable and can stand on their own feet. But this will mean that those kind of, you know, green uh, cement or low carbon cement, green steel, et cetera, can start to be rolled out across Europe. Um, but it is also the more, how shall I say, smaller scale things that need to be happening. And I mean, um, where again, the visibility is, is not always there, you know, uh, that this is not as complicated as people uh, fear and, and, and see. I mean, your electricity yes. cut was not a good <laughs> no, it was was an example good, uh, of what... feature. Yeah. You know, this is what people fear. So the more yeah. we can go out there and explain that, you know, it won't be overnight, but nevertheless, there are all kinds of very good solutions uh, out there that can be sure. scaled up, that can be, speed it up, uh, I think the more the acceptability will, will grow because I think there is the momentum, there is a lot of readiness now in uh, the population to say, okay, we also want to, to contribute. 
and do our share. Uh, but, but these things we need to bring together, together with the planning by the authorities to say, okay, we are going to bundle all the different funding streams uh, and the regulation that is out there, the predictability, the clarity, uh, and, and do it. Because, uh, yeah, I think it brings us back to what Martin was saying, since now he's put his camera on. He's here, yeah. Uh, they're communicating, uh, and yeah. again, not just between us, you know, but between those that need to uh, be brought in contact with all these solutions. There is a lot of private money also, and with inflation, of course, the one the upside of one upside of inflation is that you know people want to invest. I have a colleague; her daughter is in Argentina, and we, she heard from the people there. They're just spending, spending. This is mm. one way to, to to spend, you know. So uh, we need to, yeah, uh, communicate more and 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 bring the solutions to, to the society and and basically sure. um, keep on you know build and 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 strengthen this acceptability in order to uh, to make it happen on the ground because otherwise i think we will experience a backlash and of course yeah. it's going to be next winter we all know that so before then i would say we really need to see some some real um impact on the ground action impact on the ground no indeed Yvonne. and i know martin wanted to respond to one of the points made and also we've had a question about whether is this possible can we really do this together can we do, can we, given all the planetary boundaries, can we move ahead on, on, on competitiveness? So Martin, I don't know if you want to round us off with a uh, response to some of this uh, and to that. Um, and then I think we'll have to bring this session to a close, but a quick point from you, Martin, go ahead. Yeah, I'll be uh, as brief as I can. I think uh, the question about the, the planetary boundaries goes back to what economic model, what model of development are we trying to pursue when we're talking about competitive industry or competitive economies? And I think, mm -hmm. Um, there, the way we talk about and understand competitiveness has to reflect we're now in an economy that is in transition towards a sustainable model of development. And therefore, we have to change the way we not just think about, but measure performance in that context, taking into account planetary boundaries, notably climate change, but also it was mentioned by Peter, biodiversity, uh, circular economy, resource use, and so on. The, the model I mentioned that we've developed at CRSL, the Competitive Sustainability Index, uses the Commission's Competitive Sustainability Framework and seeks to integrate, in just the way Yvonne said, a holistic yeah. way, a means of measuring that. If we don't measure it, we will keep misaligning. And there are, I'm happy to say from the model we've developed, lots of positive trade-offs. You don't have to sacrifice one thing for another. There is a lot of social benefit, as we know well, to many of yeah. these changes. We need to scale up the investment speed, simplifi simplification uh, and scale, exactly as uh, was said, as, is key to this economically. But there's a lot that we can do better in measuring in order that we do those things in practice well uh, quickly too. Mm -hmm. So I'll just uh, leave it at that if I may. So thank you everybody. We're, we've hit the end of it. Uh, thank you for your patience. It's been a classic online meeting with all the things that that brings. So. I'd just like to end by saying, yes, absolutely. We support all these remarks about how we should be a global leader in sustainability. We believe we have support from businesses. We really see the momentum also across the world. And, and to your point, Peter, I think we're ready to be very present at some of these big moments internationally. We see the need for alignment and cooperation, and we really, um, look forward to working in alliances with all of you to, to drive forward some of these big uh, questions as we move forward this year. And we um, hope to look, hope to keep this discussion moving. This was the second in a series that we've been having with these, these global, these business networks across Europe. And so we look forward to continuing these discussions and, and keeping in touch as, as this year develops. So thank you everybody for your patience. Thank you for joining us and, and look forward to, to speaking to you all soon. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.